welcome back everybody and it gives me immense pleasure and honor to uh, uh, introduce our panelists and speakers for this session um the first one being uh, mr rajiv sadanan uh, he is the ceo of the health system transformation platform a not for profit company that works in implementation research in health systems he was recently appointed as the kerala cms advisor to combat covid-19 pandemic he belonged to the ias uh, in an administrative service who is specialized in health systems and health financing during his three tenures as additional health Sec secretary of kerala he initiated transformation of health systems with a focus on primary care designing and executing disease prevention and health promotion programs integrating social and epidemiological determinants to health care and applying technology to improve health care delivery our next uh, panelist is dr dinesh baswal With 14 years of public health and maternal health experience, Dr. Baswal has been a pioneer in maternal health and has helmed various historic national level programs such as Pradhan Mantri Surakshit Matriv Abhiyan, Asha and Laksh Labor Room Quality Improvement Initiative. He has also successfully implemented the first of its kind skill lab for various health workers in association with prestigious institutes like Lady Hardinge Medical College, Vardhaman Mahavir Medical College, with technical support from Liverpool School of Tropical Medi Medicine. Our next panelist is Dr. G. N. Rao, uh, who founded the L. V. Prasad I Institute in 1987 after a successful career in United States as an academic ophthalmologist. His area of specialization includes diseases of the cornea, eye banking, and corneal transplantation, community eye health, eye care policy, and planning. He has published more than three hundred papers in national and international journals, and has contributed several book chapters. In addition to serving on the editorial board of several journals, he was honored by the government of India in two thousand and two with the fourth highest Indian Civilian Award of Padma Shri. He was elected in two thousand and seventeen to the Ophthalmology Hall of Fame, instituted by the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. And last but not the least, although you have been seeing. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Divya Sashadri, who is the clinical professor in marketing area and director of ISB Center for Business Markets, and is our moderator today. His area of interest are B to business to business marketing, corporate entrepreneurship and strategy, and healthcare. He has over fifteen years of industrial experience before joining academics since two thousand. Prior to joining ISB in two thousand and sixteen, he taught at IIM Bangalore and at IIM Ahmedabad as visiting faculty. He works closely with several companies, providing them training and consulting services in his area of expertise. After joining academics twenty years ago, he has developed over one hundred case studies, authored several research papers, and co-authored five books. With this, I'd like to uh, hand it back to Professor Sishadri or uh, Mr. Rajiv Sadanan to take it forward. You have to choose. You have to choose who you are handing it over to. <laughs> to I will take it. Uh, take the baton. <laughs> and introduce santosh kraleti who is also here dr santosh uh, he is uh, basically going to summarize the whole morning's proceedings and he is uh, right now after his medical education heading several uh, ngos which are focused upon breast milk bank then adolescent mm -hmm. health and also uh, eye care uh, eradication of blindness and he his organization works uh, pan india so he will come back at the end after our panel discussion to summarize hello everyone thank you professor thank you okay now i call upon dr rajiv sadanandan ji to talk uh, give us the plenary talk for about half an hour and then we will have a panel discussion for 45 minutes and finally we'll have a q and a for 30 minutes so that will take us to close to 1 o'clock and then uh, we'll hand over to santosh for wrapping up the day's proceedings over to you rajiv ji let me thank uh, all the uh, organizers for having invited me to this uh, me to this session but let me clarify that uh, most of what i'm going to say i mean you can talk about uh, impact on population health in uh, in different ways but i'm going to be focusing on the former health for formal health sector Uh, and uh, i must also uh, submit that this will be indexed on my experience of stewarding uh, the health sector of a state and also my experience of having seen the way the system functioned uh, during the pandemic in that state 
uh, which is Kerala. Now, uh, often I've been told that the health system in Kerala is, uh, uh, is, is, is more privileged, which is not true. Having seen health system in many other states, I can vouch that what is applies to Kerala applies to almost every other state except for you know, minor variations. But if there's, a, if there's a difference, we can talk about during the discussion session. Now, I have structured my uh, presentation to, uh, into three areas. One is those things that have positively impacted the health sector, those that have negatively impacted the health sector, and most importantly, what have we learned from this, uh, uh, this pandemic, from managing this pandemic, that will have an impact on our long-term management of the health sector. Uh, when you come to the things that have positively impacted the health sector, the most mundane, of course, is that there's been high levels of investment in uh, hospitals. And when I say hospitals, I mean government hospitals, um, especially in supportive care, including uh, availability of oxygen and surprisingly a large amount of ventilators, laboratory equipment. This certainly will have a salutary impact on the care provided by these hospitals in future. Now, uh, many states have augmented uh, uh, an area that was sorely lacking, which was the human resources in health, mostly doctors, nurses, uh, uh, and in some cases, even outreach workers. And uh, many, because the attention of the highest level of political executive was focused in the sector, uh, many of the vacant posts have now been filled up and absentees have been called back, which again has been a, a positive thing. But when I talk to my former colleagues, the most striking thing that I've seen is a high morale that is an evidence in the government health systems. People feel that we have, you know, we stood up to this pandemic for a year and uh, at least where I am, uh, we, are, we are waiting for an uptick in the epidemic uh, post the uh, local government elections that are due now. And while we get slightly worried, out of the field, people are confident we can handle it. Now, partly it has come through the capacity, uh, the, the uh, a, a amount invested in improving the capacity of clinicians and nursing staff and other uh, you know, uh, functionaries at the cutting edge level. This has been, this has been constantly improved and they have, they have had to do many things that they thought that, that they would never do. Those of you um, among here who manage hospitals know that intubating is not something that is commonly done by every clinician, but during the crisis, whoever was available, you know, who were, who, whichever nursing staff was available, had to do it, had been trained and went about doing it. They also had to take critical decisions. There was no one to you know, uh, turn to. And, and thanks to their training, the criti critical decisions that they took, save lives and they're very happy about that and, and that success is kind of added to their confidence. So I believe that uh, post the uh, COVID pandemic, the system is going to be extremely confident in dealing with a crisis should we be content with it. And in passing, uh, I'm convinced that this is not the first pandemic. This is certainly not going to be the last pandemic and we have to get ready for future pandemics. And what I've just, the, the things I've just mentioned has, uh, you know, has uh, uh, contributed to building that confidence. I also see the similar confidence among the health administrators. Uh, doctors will pardon me, but generally doctors don't make good administrators, you know, uh, unlike uh, engineers. I mean, that's a strong statement. I'll defend that later if I have to. But during this crisis, people came good. The district health administrators, the superintendents uh, managed it. And the, they were able to take the team with them. They managed a the heavy workload. And as one of the district health officers was telling me, even the shirkers did not take leave and move off. They all you know, came back again and again and again. And it didn't get over. It just kept coming on and on. And that was kind of, you know, uh, again, added to uh, the confidence. Now, uh, the another good thing that has happened is, in health system, again, in government, we are used to micromanagement from the top. But because there was no space for that, many of the local officers have learned to take decisions because you know, they had no other option. I hope that going forward, the uh, 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 managers will uh, uh, focus on, on, you know, on uh, in improving the decentralization of authority and decision making in the health sector, which, as we know, is a good thing for better management. They have uh, uh, 
during H- it was during hiv that we started looking uh, at uh, universal precautions but then it kind of dropped off uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, hospital staff have been well trained on avoiding healthcare associated infections and on ensuring personal protection kerala was lucky in the sense that not lucky but we learned this during the nipah crisis but across the country i believe hospital staff have learned the uh, learned the you know uh, necessity for controlling healthcare associated infections and this will not only help in managing future epidemics but also improve the quality of care in government hospitals like antimicrobial resistance and so on now the other good thing that has happened is providers and patients have got used to something that we are not aware of before that was teleconsultation and remote management practitioners are now aware that you know that uh, uh, that of the possibilities and limitations of consultation teleconsultation has tremendous opportunities to improve services in underdeveloped areas and that is underserved areas and that is now recognized however to make this functional it is necessary to add other uh, you know technological aspects such as point of care diagnostics electronic health record decision support systems and application of uh, artificial intelligence in managing the teleconsultation process i hope that going forward Uh, we will be investing in doing this and that is again going to make a lot of difference in universal health coverage we can expand on that uh, during the discussion time if we need to uh, but it has not been it's not been you know uh, uh, not been entirely positive there have been negative feedbacks on this the most important thing was the because the extra effort spent on uh, uh, on um, uh, covid many time constrained activities and i'm sure dr dinesh baswal will expand on this such as uh, child immunization and mental care family planning procedures have been adversely affected and this will have long term consequences i mean it depends on how will we manage it the uh, many non covid cases which have been easily managed at an early stage have been postponed and now they are now coming as uh, acute cases which again is not a good thing for the for the uh, for the system we are now seeing the sequelae of uh, covid coming up and 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 it's baffling us there are cardiac complications pulmonary complications neurological complications the problem is that we did not know whether these are self limiting or uh, they will convert themselves to chronic conditions and i hear cases of uh, extremely aggressive management of these uh, cases which may not be a good thing that is happening but again as i said it is it is uh, uh, we are unsure of how it will pan out and god forbid if this condition is is it becomes uh, serious the load on our our already stressed health system could be bad uh, for the future uh, the other uh, uh, area that is uh, that's really hurt is going to hurt us is the long term gains that we have made in areas such as hypertension diabetes screening management on tuberculosis uh, treatment people who have on mental health issues they have not had access to these services and i need not tell you what the consequences of this would be uh, this is where the resilience comes in and i'm afraid in very few of the health systems we have been able to firewall these long term interventions against the impact of uh, of of uh, uh, covid many health workers sadly have been lost to covid 19 many have been infected and we see that fatigue among health workers as they come but again heroically they coming back but but you can see the uh, difference in efficiency when they come among the medical I mean, uh, education you know serious uh, gaps have come and i hope a policy decision is taken regarding this many students of medicine have missed important clinical training which is very crucial uh, pgs in many uh, government teaching hospitals have been deployed on just managing covid uh, kids have been uh, our, the young students have been spending i mean seeing nothing but uh, covid for the last uh, uh, few years and that again is not a good thing for uh, their training uh, it has had a serious impact on the private sector especially the recently started uh, debt finance institutions they have been affected uh, severely affected economically and even now when the business is coming back uh, i hear stories about you know how difficult it is to 
to to climb back and maybe uh, we could discuss that uh, i mean i'm sure that some um, uh, in the last session some references made to it but that again is going to have a serious impact on investments in the health sector two sad things that happened in covid management one is that the too much of attention was paid to the tertiary sector especially intensive care and this whole obsession with ventilators i believe has hurt the uh, system stewardship uh, ideal strategy in fact that is what you know we were we we we, we saw in uh, kerala kerala also started with uh, this large emphasis on the tertiary sector but soon we realized that 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 wouldn't work and that was then uh, changed to a, a, a four stage management of uh, of cases where the uh, domiciliary cases would stay at home uh, at home the mildly symptomatic or people who could not be quarantined would be put in a first line treatment center which would be managed by the local phc the second level uh, treatment centers where the slightly you know higher cases but not the serious cases would be managed there and then the only serious ones would go up to the next level the advantage of having done this was that we never faced the crisis of uh, intensive care uh, beds that happened in many other places which i believe was because of the lack of a proper triaging system lot of unnecessary cases were pushed up and because that uh, that that confidence was not there people started panicking and uh, and uh, you know uh, and 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 started knocking on the doors of uh, um, intensive care units on the other hand if we had a good primary care system where a proper triage would have happened and then a, 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 a titrating process of based on the extent of severity i think we would have managed it much better in fact the uh, sobering lesson we learned was that uh, the uptake in domiciliary treatment i mean of people staying at home was much higher if the local phc medical officer was trusted if you could stay at home but if you had a problem and you 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 call the local doctor and 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 if you are confident that he would pick up the phone if you are confident that he would go uh, to the needed extent to ensure that you are taken care of you are more more confident to stay at home this is something that many many of you would have seen a good primary care doctor who has a standing in the in the community can achieve wonders and that lesson is something that should have been learned but i'm i'm afraid it has not been uh, fully uh, understood and and I, that may affect the method of uh, investments that may happen in future the other wrong lesson that was learned is has been a bane of uh, epidemics in this country that is fudging data is a good strategy to manage epidemics from the 2002 sars epidemic we know that unless you are are transparent about the data uh, your public health response will be limited it is important to be transparent about the data it's important to have a good surveillance system and let the people know what the truth is otherwise an essential component of uh, of uh, managing a pandemic which is trust would be lost and um, uh, i mean i'm afraid uh, concerning the way media and many of the people at the top have responded there has been a, a lesson learned that uh, not being transparent is the right thing to do which is which would be disastrous for managing a pandemic i hope that that lesson is unlearned in future the pandemic has led to uh, levels in you know difference in perception uh many of us working in the sector have uh, had difficulty convincing people of the need to invest in in health sector now it is widely respected widely recognized and respected the community has begun to appreciate the work of both clinical and outreach staff and uh, this respect is has been a great morale booster for the sector and uh, uh and and as i mentioned before it has already had good impact and i hope that when people think about where to invest in csr funds in future when finance ministers decide where to allocate resources in future health will not get ignored and i believe the pandemic has helped in that the other thing that the economists will now agree is on a on a very raw uh, assessment of return on investment the return on ri on health is now obvious we saw that uh, those states that had invested in health could manage the situation better now we know that unless health is heavily invested in other economic activities will suffer so even if the ri uh, roi on uh, on health is uh, negligible the impact it has on the economy is proved that you cannot scale down the investments in health sector and uh, 
uh, and in areas where you had good health system, economy could open up faster. And I hope that will be a lesson that is learned. The other thing that again should have has been obvious to people who work in this field is that is the importance of having a good government healthcare system. In the past, uh, many you know so-called thinkers and uh, academics and uh, and especially people in the private sector. have been running down the government sector saying look it's inefficient i don't know on what parameters you call government sector inefficient but it is inefficient it is uh, you know corrupt etc etc and we've been promoting uh, private sector consumption in private sector as the way to go we have we know starting from the surat plague which is the earliest i remember in public health that government health system will be the only one that will be standing when others have disappeared and now we know that investing in government uh, health system is very important no matter how good your private sector is how good your purchase is if you don't invest in 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 uh, government health sector it is like uh, not uh, having an army i hope that also gets realized the other thing uh, uh, that um, um, that um, uh, has been has got some importance is the non clinical aspects of medicine such as public health epidemiology and i i believe many many people are hearing this discipline called epidemiology for the first time microbiology all these have attention at, uh, attracted more attention and i hope that going forward we will be seeing more you know uh, good medical students uh, opt for these specializations in future along with that the systemic aspects such as health information procurement and inventory management resource management system they also have been they proved very important i don't know whether the importance has been recognized but any system that has functioned well will will have at the back end these uh, these systems backing them up and uh, going forward i hope this will attract more investments as we go on now uh, uh, technology as i mentioned before has been accepted but there is a huge area that is available and with the new found interest in health i hope people who work in artificial intelligence people who work in machine learning people who work in decision support systems will start working with healthcare providers so that the full benefit of technology can be uh, can be reaped the uh, other thing that we realized was that remote training is possible i mean we all learned of zoom almost for the first time during this uh, pandemic and now in it's possible to get a large number of people trained on in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a decentralized fashion by just uh, through the remote training we have developed techniques extensively and uh, and hopefully that will be used for training people the big advantage there is actually building the capacity of primary care doctors primary care doctors should be able to handle everything that is thrown at them and this would be one of the areas that we can use to build their skills in diabetes management cancer treat cancer screening and so on i hope that will get uh, uh, will get recognized uh, the the other lesson that we learned was that it all depended on the states i mean center was giving the money uh, issuing you know uh, directives and so on but the real management was done by the states and the districts and that again is a lesson that we need to know the uh, other uh, area which uh, you know we had realized in the past while handling nipa is that epidemic is always followed by an infodemic the more serious the epidemic the more serious the pandemic the more severe the infodemic uh, unfortunately uh, the health systems are not fully equipped to handle this uh, uh, this info in, 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 was not fully equipped to handle the infodemic and we saw the large number of disinformation campaign that happened now the worst is yet to come because as camp as vaccines are rolled out i expect to see both from the mischief mongers and from the from the uh, anti vaccine lobby a huge barrage of uh, you know of uh, disinformation being thrown at us we cannot ignore the social media uh, that is where a lot of these battles are fought and lost and it is important for for us to uh, group the youngsters i mean they are more comfortable in dealing with the twitters and uh, instagrams and so on and facebook facebook is our age but uh, the later ones are where the real damage happened and whatsapp also so something that we have not done in the past which is having a policy to manage the uh, infodemic is, is is again that we will have to do 
what are the other things that uh, you know uh, we have learned one is that as i mentioned before this was not the potentially first pandemic this will not be the last uh, pandemic and we have to be ready for the next pathogen the uh, we don't know it may not even be as harmless i wouldn't say harmless wrong word to use but considering what could have happened with this pandemic i would say much worse uh, pa pathogens are possible it's sovereign to note <coughs> that very few states have systems to pick up emerging pathogens and by the time you know the, uh, the the pathogen is picked up it might have caused huge damage in the past uh, it's got uh, in, in 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 the population it's quite likely that uh, as has happened in all the other potential pandemics in the past this also would be zoonotic and uh, it's important then to look at the uh, to expand our surveillance to include the one health approach which also looks at animals you know environment uh, uh, fishes and so on but it's also i mean what this disease for that matter even ebola taught us is that it's also important to look at wildlife because most of the uh, most probably the next uh, pathogen is going to come from uh, you know they also come from the wildlife uh, crossing over to the species and creating trouble uh, the i'm not going into the whole issue of what it should do on managing the environment we had uh, talk on that earlier which but it's certainly important the second thing that many of us realize when uh, handling the hiv pandemic is that we are now linked to each other and every part of the world is linked to every other part the next pathogen may come from anywhere and even if it starts in antarctica it is important to develop to to watch for what is happening develop linkages for information sharing and skills and be alert to the pathogen and the uh, ways of spread in fact i would say uh, in a way we were lucky because uh, uh, the pathogen was uh, was uh, confined to an initial epicenter and if we had managed it well like what happened in the case of um, sars this could have been uh, much would have been managed better but next time around we'll be ready for that and and the the second thing is that we need to shore up our research capacity including genomics and clinical trials remember the whole uh, uh, rapid vaccine uh, uh, development was made possible because the capacity china has developed in genomics one of the countries that leads the world in genomics on in on in the first week of january they published the uh, full sequence uh, of the genome which is uh, taken by all over the world and has been used now what is our uh, ability in genomics it's important that we start investing in this the other sad thing that came out was the lack of clinical validation of drugs you know our decisions on clinical uh, uh, use of drugs have to be uh, evidence based we saw all sorts of uh, remedies being pushed which should ideally have gone to a clinical trial if not placebo controlled at least uh, you know a, a standard of care uh, controlled trial and then and then introduced even now we do not have reliable evidence on uh, on on uh, you know on uh, which with effectiveness is drugs and i was really sorry to see uh, many senior uh, academics forgetting the basics of uh, of clinical trial that correlation does not mean causation i, I, I hope in future we won't we will not be caught uh, you know uh, caught uh, unawares like that the other thing that we uh, missed is the learning system that can uh, that will make it possible for us to pick up learnings from the people on the ground in the front line and filter that up a lot of the traffic that happened <coughs> during this pandemic was uh, was 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 one way that is downward but which we miss the 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 uh, learning that substantial learning that was there on the field and i hope in future we will have a system to do that in future when we uh, so in the past when we talked about uh, search capacity we were planning for search capacity of hospitals now we know that a hospital or even a region may not be enough we have to plan for search capacity for the entire health system and it's 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 going to be a huge uh, uh, task but something that to plan for and invest the what we saw when we were trying to scale up capacity was the most crucial limiting factor was a human resource in health it is not possible to generate uh, hrh in the short term but what we uh, uh, what we have to do is to tolerate 
task shifting. The medical community has to let go of its uh, stranglehold on many of these functions and let other levels of care come up. The nurse practitioners, uh, pharmacy physicians come up and start being trained on doing things that is now being confined to the medical profession. And that cannot, it happened during this pandemic, but it was more forced on us. If we have to actually uh, have a, a policy decision, we need to have changes in the Drugs and Pharmaceuticals Act and, and, and so on. The other thing that we missed was the uh, firewalling of core services, what I mentioned before. What's our system to ensure that childhood immunizations, the, uh, the, the NCD uh, treatment, mental health issues will not, get, uh, uh, will not get affected? And we lacked a strategy for that. Uh, what we missed sorely was the lack of a working relationship between government and private sector. These are two areas that remain at arm's length. Uh, when most of the time, even in the background papers, circular dis discussion, I've heard about, I've heard for draconian measures and regulation. I would say <clears throat> we need to listen to the private sector. They had their problems and we need to find ways in which we can, we can, uh, we can um, work with them. For example, you know, I saw uh, rates being fixed. But don't we need a costing system that would at least compensate the private sector for the money that is invested? Yes, there have been cutthroat uh, carriers. Then where is your regulation for that? So, so it's important to rethink the uh, regulation and the management and the involvement between private sector and government sector, something that uh, the uh, private sector has been stonewalling. But I think for future, this is something that we need to, uh, uh, to work. The, our reliance has always been on tertiary hospitals. And as I mentioned before, this has been disastrous. And we need to think of a balanced healthcare system, focusing a last more on the primary uh, sector going forward. The other sad thing that happened was the uh, social security for migrant workers. I, mean, I don't even want to go into it, what, what happened during the uh, initial stage of the epidemic, even now, when I mean, our organization is, um, is, is, is engaged in trying to build up health systems for the migrant workers, the, but the recognition of the need for that is, is, is extremely low. Now, uh, as, I, as I've been trying to cover through this, we have learned a lot. I mean, we should have learned a lot or we have imbibed a lot. A lot of it is going to take time to assimilate and analyze. But I hope, like we discussions like this, we are able to bring this uh, analysis together and hopefully that will inform our decisions going forward. Once again, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Thank you, Mr. Sadanandan. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Dinesh Baswal, Dr. G. N. Rao and uh, Mr. Sadanandan to, uh, you know, form the panel. And I would uh, like uh, Professor D.V.R. Shishadri, uh, sir, to moderate the same. Over to you, you. Uh, Professor. Thank you, Arna, sir. First, I'd like to compliment Rajiv ji for an incredible, impassioned, I don't have words to describe. I've made copious notes about seven or eight pages. You know, it was a rapid fire of uh, learnings. So what are the negatives? What are the positives? of the whole uh, experience and the learnings and it is huge. It actually can make a couple of PhD theses to go deeper into each of them. That's the uh, depth of experience that he has brought to the table. Hats off, sir, and your mere presence and elucidation have really enriched this panel's discussion. Uh, so uh, I think- thank, I, thank, you for your, thank you for your nice words. I was thanking you and I was muted, sorry. Sorry, Evita, uh, I think, has uh, uh, summarized it. Dr. Evita Fernandez, you might be knowing her amazing candor with loads of information and important lessons for all of us. I think she's at the forefront of uh, women and child health care and, uh, you know, trying to avoid over-medicalization of birthing and so on. So we have a lot of very uh, interesting comments. So I'd like to now move to the panel discussion. Once again, we have a very, very... A uh, high-profile panel, and we are really blessed to have the three of you here. And uh, like the format of the previous uh, panel, we have two questions for each panelist. But first, I'll go through one cycle of one question each, and feel free to expand sideways, deeper, upwards, 360 degree on the question. The questions are basically uh, based upon what might be of interest to this 
forum to listen. So the first question is directed to uh, Mr. Rajiv Sadananda. Uh, during the current pandemic, the population in general has been hesitant to travel distances to seek health care as well as for any other services. Most people, including folks like me, have been just homebound. Maybe we have roamed around one kilometer around the house, like a dog with a tether. Uh, while it has been widely recognized that based on impetus provided by the pandemic, distributed and decentralized healthcare is the way forward for the future, including ways to uh, handle the future pandemics. As a person who's been at the top of the health administration in the country, what challenges do you see in moving in this direction of pushing the level of care to the primary from the current predominant obsession with tertiary and to a lesser extent secondary care and the lack of any reasonable form of health care in more, most parts of the country in the hinterland. You also hinted at it, sir, that uh, a lot of people make a bill line to the tertiary because the primary health care uh, you know, doctor is not responsive or something, they start panicking and then they say, am I going to die? And then the system just collapses. So everybody recognizes this in the healthcare system that there is need for a lot of primary uh, focus, but uh, intention and reality, there's a huge gap. So what are your takeaways from that uh, very important question? Dr. Sharnath, this, here you will have to, uh, Shashadri, you will have to uh, moderate me because this is a favorite topic and I won't stop talking on this. You know? So you'll really have to uh, control the session. Okay. Now, um, so if I may just say after about uh, seven or eight or minutes, I'll just wave to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 so you can be sure that I will just carry on because this is my favorite topic while in government and outside it. Look at this way. The uh, a, a primary care doctor in NHS, the GP, uh, he is a specialist. He has a three-year, uh, you know, uh, PG. Uh, he handles. Can you guess how many patients? Two thousand five hundred cases max. Two thousand five hundred people are assigned. And if you go to a GP practice in the UK, you will find he's got nurses, he's got nurse practitioners, he's got remote, the whole, whole paraphernalia. I could run a subjudicial hospital with the kind of paraphernalia that is there in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a GP practice. Compare that to what our GPs have, I mean, our primary care doctors have. 30,000 is the population that is assigned to the poor guy. And he has one nurse, maybe a pharmacist, maybe a lab technician, and I was preparing a list of the activities that had to be done. And uh, well, while we were reworking the primary care in my state, I went back to my finance minister and said, look, I, I present this argument and said, we cannot run a primary care with this kind of stuff. He said, how many do you want? I said, I want, I don't want the 2,500 for the GP. I want 5,000. Now, so which means that instead of one doctor, you will now be leading how many? Six? Uh, and how many nurses? So he said, forget it. And finally, we, we boiled down to having uh, one doctor for 10,000 population. Now, if the primary care uh, has to develop this capacity, I must have confidence in the primary care uh, doctor. For that, you have to invest in training the primary care doctor in handling anything that is, that is thrown at him. It could be uh, it could be uh, an MI, it could be a stroke, but he should be able to recognize that and he should be able to refer to the, uh, to the appropriate level and his reference must have, uh, must have value. Two, he must have the, a manageable number because no primary care situation works unless you have a population assigned to them. Now, which means that we have to at least quadruple the current investment that is available in, 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 in primary care. Three, Currently, when outside Kerala, I spoke to, I speak, uh, I look at different health systems. They understand primary care as mother and child care. That is not true. I mean, like, you know, uh, no primary care can be just mother and child. A primary care doctor is responsible for the entire health of the population assigned to him. And when you do that, and when, doc when, when the population has the opportunity of developing confidence in the the uh, primary care doctor and the primary care doctor has enough clout to refer to, uh, to the appropriate level as reference would be treated with value. 
only then will we have a system it it calls for a fundamental rethinking of redesigning the 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 health system thank you thank you sir uh, so this uh, if i may have a follow on question uh, you know you did say that uh, it requires some massive amount of training also changing the mindset of people that they think that primary care is mother and child care whereas people can come with all sort of ailments including tb or cancer or this and guy should have uh, motivation and training but uh, if i may ask because i have been peeping into not the type of extensive experience you had i have lost some it, not, I can't hear you uh, some uh, okay i can't is it okay now my problem i don't know is it okay now sir hello is it better now arnas can you hear me yes divya i can hear you i was saying maybe until he comes on you can ask the next question uh, to okay to somebody just, else uh, yeah, maybe he looks like his internet froze or something okay uh, yeah i think now we are back sir yeah i'm back yes yeah okay so i was just asking a question you have said that there is tremendous need for massive investment in primary care both in terms of hr in terms of training motivation and so on but uh, do you given that there is also a dichotomy between the funds coming from the center and the implementation at the states and then the states also have political agendas especially if they are from opposition parties so there is a very clear schism or a divide in the country where there is a, just to show that the party at the center is good for nothing there is a lot of one upmanship that's happening so and given that also the indian government has been roughly allocating 1.5% of gdp to healthcare whereas the ideal people have talked about is 5 6% what do you think would be the triggers at a policy level to make that shift you said that the covid has uh, alerted governments that they have to put more money where uh, on healthcare but what sort of thinking is going on in the government about making substantial increase in this whole healthcare space uh, far cry from what it is today it's a question of you know how important it is to the people because what is important to the people is what will be important for the politician also and i think uh, i think it was ysr who demonstrated that health is is a politically saleable commodity i mean you may not agree with the way he sold it but he demonstrated that it has a political you know uh, dividend uh, for it so and and uh, going forward i think the politicians are very smart people i mean they don't they won't play a game if it doesn't suit them so once they understand that this is an area worth investing it will you'll certainly you know contribute to it let me give an example of what happened in 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 kerala when the new government came i was lucky that the finance minister was my former macro uh, professor so i was able to convince him that if you in, increase this kind of investment it's going to be politically you know uh, politically uh, viable and right now the electioneering is going on outside my house and what they keep pushing what this government has done is the investment in health sector and and for the, the major thing that is going to help this government uh, uh, in 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 the campaigning as it has happened in the past is going to be political i mean uh, the investment in health so health sells politically and central government gives only about uh, you know uh, 30 to 40 percent of the funds most of the funds come from uh, uh, from the state government uh, um, but even that's not adequate uh, in states like uh, kerala the local bodies also put in money so the and and going forward i expect a substantial money to come from csr the question is we all talk about uh, 1.2 percent being raised to 2.5 if you get that are you ready for it do we have the strategy to deal with it so let us as health planners look at what we need to do and building the capacity of primary care doctors don't take too much of a problem we trained our entire uh, phc medical officers in one district uh, on uh, cancer remotely so the, rather than looking for excuses let's look for trying to find ways out and my experience is that if you if you're really passionate about it money can be found thank you rajiv ji i now like to move to dr dinesh baswal 
uh, he's been at the helm of uh, the nation's maternal health programs. Sir, what do you see as the impact of preoccupation of the national, nation's health system with the current pandemic on attention being given to maternal health care? I think this is the classic problem of foc excessive focus on the urgent, important, here and now present when people are suffering with COVID. Whereas maternal health is something which is one year later, two years later, and probably a generation later because the impact will have long-standing effect. And obviously people, whether it is citizens or government or whoever, would like to focus on the urgent here and now burning problems. So what is the impact of COVID on the maternal health care in the country? And of course, we also have to talk about it in the context of future pandemics because the same patterns will repeat. You need to unmute, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me on this panel. Uh, I uh, also want to pay my respect to Rajivji for, you know, we have been uh, uh, met on various occasions and he was on the other side and I was from the government side. Uh, today we are on the same side talking uh, on a panel for, on a very important subject. So. Uh, let me actually, you know, start with, uh, uh, you know, telling you about the various uh, challenges which we had and then come back to the maternal health issue. And uh, uh, I will uh, focus on uh, maternal health issues from, uh, you know, certain WHO collaborating center. I think we lost him. Divya, you're muted. Yeah, do you want to give him a ring or just we wait? No, no I think I, I, I think until he connects, you can move on. Or we we'll lose time. Okay, so uh, just give another ten seconds. Right. Uh, we'll use this time to move to Dr. G. N. Rao, who has uh, managed the pandemic at the L. V. Prasad Eye Institute. It's a sort of role model of how they manage, and it is a single specialty hospital. While within ophthalmology, there are streams and streams and streams of subspecialties, but. Uh, we had the perspective of uh, Dr. Komal Prasad, a multi-speciality, huge hospital, and how they coped with it. Uh, for us, uh, sir, could you talk about how LVP, which is amongst the foremost eye care providers in the world, how did COVID impact LVP? As we have heard repeatedly, all these elective procedures get postponed, pushed under the carpet. How did you cope with the challenges in terms of managing this uh, large organization that you had? How, how did LVP remain sustainable and continue to serve the public, staying, staying true to its core values without making any compromises? So these are a whole lot of questions and sub-questions. I'll uh, request you to elaborate on them. I think uh, I'll go through different uh, aspects of what we did. One is uh, how we prepared. Second is uh, how we only reopened the services. That is how we ramped up across our uh, multi-tier structure from community-based primary care to advanced tertiary care. But also on our 10 functional segments of the Institute. Initially, in the month of April, we closed down all the routine services. Before that, we communicated with our staff, informed them of the problem and what all measures we are initiating. 
And the first thing to gain their confidence and boost their morale was an announcement that none of them will lose their jobs and their full salaries will be protected. That has had a significant psychological positive impact on the entire team of 3,000 plus of our extended family, what we call of LV Prasada Institute. The second is we initiated preparation throughout the month of April when we were providing only emergency services. What we did was we trained our staff of all carders to get prepared for the care during this crisis to eliminate all possible harm to themselves, their families, and the patients that we serve and any visitors that we might have. Second is, we prepared the physical structure of the entire institute for the safety of everybody. Appropriate uh, changes were made in the check-in areas, waiting areas, all the way from entrance gate to the examination rooms and the operating rooms. That changes were made during the month of April. And the entire system was set up during that month. In May, we started with three teams, each team working for two days each, completely segregated from each other, and uh, starting our services. In June, we then made it into three days each, two teams, June, July, August. And then September onwards, we made it four days for everybody. And October and November, we had five days for everybody working. So that's how we opened up. During this process, we have seen some phenomena that have emerged. If we look at our, our functional structures in our clinical care is the first functional segment. There's a significant drop in volumes across all our levels of care from our 196 primary centers in remote rural and tribal areas to the 20 secondary centers in rural areas and the three tertiary and the one Institute of Excellence in Hyderabad. All of them have a significant drop in volumes. And for May, it recovered to around 40-45%. In July is when we came up to 60-65%. And we have seen an interesting phenomenon, probably should have been expected. That is, while the tertiary centers were struggling to improve the volumes, it's the secondary centers in rural areas and the primary centers in rural areas that have recovered much faster. They have come back to 100% by August. And right now, our secondary centers have volumes of 120% and our primary centers have volumes of 160, 170% compared to the pre-COVID volumes. Whereas our tertiary centers are still around 70 to 80%. So that's the kind of progress that we have seen. The only uh, fact that we are unhappy about, and we are trying every measure to bring it back to normal, was a significant drop in our non-paying patient volumes. Overall, we used to have 50 to 55% of our patients were what we call non-paying. That is those people who pay for nothing for their services. And those volumes have dropped significantly. And I think it's because of the problems of transportation and uh, their inability to move, etc. So that is something that, that we are working on now. It is slowly picking up, but not at the rate that we would have liked. The second area is our AI banking related to patient care. That's the one thing that has hit, taken a big hit throughout the country. But fortunately, our iBank is recovering reasonably well. And our Hyderabad iBank alone is now harvesting 
nearly 60% of the total kaniyas of the country already even though the overall number is low and uh, that is slowly improving the transplantation services and all the rehabilitation of the incurable blind services our people have uh, developed a ways of uh, treating them at distance and continue to engage them in addition they have raised money to support 500 families for their daily necessities the staff of our rehabilitation institute and then uh, in terms of education as uh, mr sadanandan pointed out it has had significant impact on the clinical training of all our trainees both the all cadres we have multiple cadres of eye care personnel that we train but what we did is we had the beginnings of this early on but during the covid time it got accelerated that is using technology we have done about 600 hours of teaching using technology to our internal trainees each month and for all outsiders throughout the country and in some other outside countries we have held 90 webinars on various aspects of eye care and over 9000 participants have uh, benefited from those we also had the benefit of some of the best of international leaders in our field participating because they were all available uh, long distance so that is a positive thing our research component has geared itself since they could not come and work in the labs and all they have spent the time on clearing up their publications and over 350 peer reviewed publications uh, occurred during this uh, past 6 months or so so in terms of capacity building which we do traditionally for other organizations in the country and other developing countries that took a beating because the people from those institutions could not come to us and we could not go there but we connected with them as much as possible using uh, various technology platforms and the other aspect is uh, we continue to work on uh, technology development one thing that happened was we connected all our primary centers with advanced technology now advanced forms of telemedicine and we accelerated the development of high technology products for early diagnosis in our technology innovation center and they have all been applied in our primary care and secondary care centers and telemedicine has become more commonly used not as much as we would have liked contrary to popular belief as long, as soon as we opened up some of the services the numbers of telemedicine consultations kind of did not grow so showing clearly at least our clientele seem to prefer physical examination on the campuses but what we also did is what we developed what is called a connect care that connects the our electronic medical record system with the patient with the doctor with the billing the whole aspect of it and that's a big development for us so these are and in terms of advocacy efforts that we are always involved in in the field of eye care both at the national and global levels we continue to participate in all the various fora and uh, did our part so overall i think we did well and i think starting uh, in september our revenues also have recovered and uh, we are slowly rebuilding our reserves what helped financially for us has been our long term planning and the lessons we learned from various international organizations and other countries of how not for profit should function of having a certain amount of reserves to meet the operating expenses a lesson that has served us very well uh, during this crisis thank you thank you dr rao it was uh, quite fascinating how you have actually shown a blueprint for many other organizations in the future to handle such crisis and what i see in a one line summary of whatever you have said which is quite a uh, amazing is that there were some deliberate actions you had done for example the reserves and so on there were some emergent things which you did not envisage for example the uh, uh, you know telemedicine uh, and then global outreach 
which was compensated to a large extent the inability of people to travel physically and so on so there were some deliberate actions there were also some emergent things that happened on the fly as things uh, uh, unfolded the other important thing is you took a strategic approach and not a knee jerk reaction so there was a gradual ramp up you didn't say okay so far we've been shut down in a cold storage till april or may now let's just uh, you know open the doors and go wild and get everybody in so it was a very very careful approach keeping your pulse on the emerging situation because covid was an unknown entity for almost all of humanity so i think that gradual ramp up and a strategic approach has helped you i like to cycle back to dr dinesh baswal basically to request him to talk about the inattention of on um, maternal healthcare in the context of over attention rightly so of the whole health system on covid back to you sir so so actually you know we have to understand that uh, for the proper understanding of impact on maternal health we have to understand that there are uh, three four major challenges which were there in our country one of the major challenges have already been highlighted by uh, mr raji and that's the precarious hr position and uh, we have uh, you know one doctor per uh, 1445 population but if you in some states it's uh, like bihar we have one doctor per 28391 and up has uh, one doctor for 19962 uh, population so this was uh, this was a major challenge the other is that about the infrastructure which we had uh, which uh, we, which we had for example less number of icu oxygen supply and of course uh, the other was the laboratory facilities which we have now i what i have done is that uh, you know there are certain certain international Uh, studies which is going on and uh, so i i will first focus on that and then come back to the indian studies which have been done of, on the impact of maternal health now one is this uh, live systematic review by professor shakila and uh, they have been collecting data and they say that uh, there is uh, you know uh, of course trend uh, percent prevalence of uh, covid and and, and pregnant women and uh, 5% of them will be asymptomatic and 40 45% will will present with cough and fever and 20% with breathlessness uh the other is that uh, you know uh the there will be 4% who they will be requiring icu uh admission and 3% will be requiring intensive ventilation and the mortality will actually be around 6 per 1000 Uh, and uh, uh, people with low bmi are actually higher risk factors you know initially you know people were thinking that normal vaginal delivery is not uh, you know uh, it is uh, so so go for cesarean section rate so so c section rate is uh, around 60% mm. yeah and there was increased the risk for admission of new nets and of course uh, pre term birth which is before 37 weeks of birth and uh, that is about two uh, pre term in 10 uh, uh, of the population uh, broadly speaking it is actually uh, the covid uh, had uh, you know similar uh, uh, prevalence as in the general population and there is an insufficient evidence to confirm mother to child transmission uh coming to the indian studies we we have there is an uh, you know access and uh, availability was an issue uh and of course uh, if you look at from the supply side and the demand side the supply side of fear of exposure inadequate uh, uh, you know uh, personal protective equipments staff being infected or under quarantine redeployment and shortage of trained staff uh overstretched uh, you know infrastructure uh, personal lack of beds on the demand side there was lack of information on the status of available of available services as well as increased fears and concerns of being exposed 
since rmn chha facilities are not stand alone so you know uh, uh, so people uh, were worried about getting infected and uh, so uh, from the uh, millions of couples have lost access to family planning services and there is an anticipation of increased unintended pregnancies uh this uh, global financial facility uh, financial facility brief in which they had said that you know more than 4 million people, uh, women will be without access to facility based uh, deliveries child mortality could increase by 40% uh, maternal mortality could increase by 52% these are all projections uh, based on the available you know data data from media you know from up bihar west bengal jharkhand odisha and chatisgarh institutional delivery may fall by 40% so on top of that you know there are you know this uh, cyclone amphan and recent cyclone in you know which hit puducherry and tamil nadu uh, actually made things uh, more worse and still we are grappling with you know and uh, of course in certain parts of the country we have this uh, increase of, of air pollution which is also helping the covid to you know be there and you know spread the disease so uh, i think uh, you know uh, there is a lot of uh, 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 you know issues there and uh, uh, i hope that uh, you know we are seeing uh, the plateauing of the covid and uh, so that we can be able to you know uh, till now things have you know been in certain state the, the they are being managed the covid is being managed very well but in some of the places you know it has gone out of hand so as to say thank you thank you dr baswal it is really nice that you really painted a big picture of it that there so many factors outside the realm of control like the uh, air pollution the cyclones and of course the different variations across states and so on but what i can summarize from what you said is there's going to be a massive increase in unintended pregnancies and resulting in deliveries second is also the uh, a whole lot of uh, focus uh, i mean uh, the children who are going to be uh, mortality of uh, the newborns is also going to rise because of lack of access to institutional delivery i like to go back to uh, rajiv ji uh, he has also been the ceo of the rashtriya swasthya bima yojana which is the national health insurance program uh, i request you to elucidate on what are the key challenges to implement equitable healthcare for all which is epitomized by organizations like arvind i care and uh, lv prasad where the poorest person can come with empty pockets and get as good a care as any boy, anybody who can pay and that's through a very finely tuned uh, uh, cross subsidization model so what are the key challenges to implement equitable health care for all irrespective of people's ability to pay especially in the context of pandemics that humanity is likely to experience uh, if you can talk about how insurance is touching the cure for pandemics and the way forward of how this insurance for the poor will is it just a political hot air is there a, absolutely substance on the ground and a person who is penniless can he at least get a glimpse of reasonable care uh, which more affluent people in big cities have been able to bulldoze their way into large hospitals and get uh, a lot of uh, good care over to you sir um i will step back from the uh, present situation and look at the larger picture which is uh, there are various ways of financing healthcare and when you mention equitable the best would be if government can pay for like you have in the nhs if government can uh, pay tax funded free at the source of consumption that will be the ideal thing to go but during my lifetime i don't think i'll be seeing that and i've given up hope of that long time ago the other option is having a uh, is, is is something like the graduated model that you know uh, that uh, uh, lv prasad and um, arvind have been doing which is uh, taken at a larger level what that would mean would be that for the people who cannot pay 
uh, you develop a system either by tax funding or by cross subsidization that they are uh, paid for now to some extent the pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana the, the, the current insurance program tries to cover that um, but the problem is that when you look at the pattern of uh, of uh, out of pocket payment a large part of it is actually happening for outpatient care whereas the insurance scheme looks only at uh, at uh, hospitalization uh, uh, cover so the uh, and and for outpatient care while there are international models by which insurance has paid for outpatient care um, uh, we have not been able to develop uh, anything like that um, uh, in india so the ideal situation would be that we we create a system in which the poor and slightly above that poor if you go by the uh, i would say about uh, 40 to 50% of the population would need government support for paying for their care now the other part rather than going for you know out of pocket expenditure at the time of consumption the fee for service at the time of consumption it will be good if we can pool this money that everyone is spending anyway you know i mean when you look at the total amount of money that is spent by the indian population on healthcare and if we can pool that to uh, in the form of an insurance or a pooled fund and have a have a better uh, negotiation with providers it can still be managed that is with the amount of money that is being spent by the indian population on healthcare we can still uh, uh, cover part of it because uh, you know uh, but that will call for a system by which uh, 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 keeping the poor aside for the non poor pooling this money that they will anyway spend uh, and 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 taking that in advance developing contract with private providers for you know of on some graduated kind of way and not the uh, free for all kind of thing that happens today and uh, for primary care even for the people who can pay a capitation by payment in which people pay the providers an amount in advance and the providers provide the outpatient care and health promotion services so uh, in the absence of uh, adequate government funding which uh, may not get addressed in the short term the strategic thing to do would be to use the uh, resources available in the system and pool it together and with more efficient methods of purchasing and contracting develop systems in such a way that with the same amount of money that is being spent we spend it more efficiently i agree it is sub- suboptimal but in the short term i don't see a different way of going about it thank you thank you sir the health care funding is a very very big topic i think a lot of uh, really brilliant thinkers including you have tried to address it but it's a humongous problem and uh, of course there's another issue here which is gaming the whole system especially a lot of private players are prone to gaming the system which has no easy solutions and the response of the government has been knee jerk to come with a whip and you know just ban this hospital from treating as it had happened in hyderabad three or four hospitals were summarily banned for treating covid but is that the solution what are the, the questions are all up in the air and that is where forums like ours can hopefully help another quick issue and i will come back if there is time to you so is you talked about the need for extensive primary care Uh, uplift in the primary care in terms of infrastructure and human resources but i'll come back to you after the second round of questions with the other panelists on how do we address the problem of motivation of the primary care uh, health care providers doctors nurses and so on because at least in some parts of the country once again they game the system they put their attendance and push off and uh, they draw the salary so this is another big question which will be nice maybe in the q and a part itself if you can address it as the first question it will be nice so that we try to stick to the overall time uh, and also this gaming the uh, healthcare insurance any good system we are so creative and innovative we'll find ways to game it so maybe this we can take it as the first question in the q and a back to dr dinesh baswal what steps can women who are the backbone of any society including in india they are the backbone of the family although they are 
sadly not so given such high status in many parts of the country uh, what can they do to ensure that they their children husband and extended family are future fit to ensure that the family at least is not vulnerable to the pandemics of the future they may not be having much to do with the whole society but if i am a woman with three or four children and dependents and husband what can i do to make sure that my family stays uh, less vulnerable to the future pandemics dr baswal so so it's a very interesting question which you have put and uh, you know i will uh, actually you know tell you about the entire problem which which actually is creating is this and how women can help and then come back to specifically the you know some of uh, the uh, you know, my suggestions to you know address it in the from the medical point of view so you know recently i had uh, you know basically i am quoting from the international union for conservation of nature uh, they have been you know studying that uh, and uh, how these pandemics and other things are actually coming in and uh, they think that there is a very great in, uh, actually interconnection of women's right and environmental conservatism conservation right while linkages between gender based violence and environmental issue, issues are quite complex uh, multi layered and these uh, threat actually to the human right and of course the healthy ecosystem so gender based violence is a relevance uh, relevance of the societal problem in three critical environmental contexts that is access and control of natural resources ecological pressure and threats environmental action to defend and conserve ecosystem and resources so basically you know the data shows that the, the issues are in inextricably linked connected on a global scale and preventing gender based violence and promoting gender equality can meaningfully contribute to conservate conservation work so you know uh, they had this uh, gender based violence operates as a systemic means of control to enforce and protect existing patriarchal privileges uh, concerning the natural resources and environmental uh, stewardship roles this violence against women gravely hinders conservation work which local communities by uh, oppressing and uh, excluding women women in the communities where practitioners and researchers work have a finger on the pulse of their communities and possess a unique uh, perspective on a uh, uh, solution uh, to complex environmental issues uh, so they are quoting that 80% of the earth's biodiversity exists largely in communities located in global south these societies tend to be where oppressive patriarchal structures are prevalent and female voices are silenced these uh, abusive frameworks intensify as community forests livelihoods and traditional way of life disappearing due to environmental degradation and climate change the interlinkages of uh, gender based violence and conservation offer a crucial en- entry point to change the course of these negatives male dominated structures and uh, empowered female voices icun actually you know they had uh, this uh, given that in south africa this uh, they have called this uh, black ma- the females have been joined uh, you know they have been uh, made into a group called as black mambasas they have achieved 70% reduction in rhino poaching since 2013 poaching impact communities destabilizing them increasing violent crime while less poaching results in safer communities of for women and their families and improve access to legally harvested natural resources much of which is collected by women on a daily basis and impact impacting poverty rates rates these efforts illustrate the value of women's participation in combating illegal wildlife trade and the potential for decreasing tensions between communities poachers and wildlife protection forces icn report suggests 
how reduction in gender-based violence can improve and increase the success of programs to combat illegal wildlife trade globally. So basically, you know, this pandemic actually is happening due to the, as you know about this, you know, this a zoonotic uh, uh, disease, basically transmitting from bats to, you know, the humans. So the idea that, you know, what women can play, they can play a major role. They can form, you know, communities in the, uh, in their settings and, uh, you know, take uh, all these uh, important, especially the gender-based violence, which is uh, very prevalent and uh, they have huge impact. So I think uh, we have to, you know, basically work in this area. Uh, and, uh, and subsequently, since, uh, you know, uh, the woman is a homemaker and they actually control the, uh, you know, every, uh, uh, the, you know, finances. The important thing in certain COVID time is that prevention is the most important thing where you need to, you know, prevent that, you know, whatever the advisory is there, we have a Asha Varkan on a 1000 population. And these are that, you know, they can, uh, you know, pass on the information. There has to be, you know, have, they have to be careful about the rumors. The rumors have to be, you know, uh, nip in the bud. Whatever correct information is coming, they need to have the awareness about it. And, you know, uh, basically, uh, it's all about the cornerstone for preventing such diseases is prevention only. And, you know, in, and in case of mild cases, uh, they, they need to report immediately to the health uh, authorities where they can be, you know, uh, treated. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was very expansive coverage. You talked about uh, gender equality as one of the cornerstones to address these type of pandemics. And the second thing that I picked up is the need for very authentic information, not based on hearsay, rumors and so on. Uh, very valuable food for thought. Uh, the final question is to Dr. Rao, having successfully scaled LVPI through this pandemic, and obviously now they will have this a very strong learning organization, so I'm sure they will be future fit for any uh, other pandemics, although I hope and pray like we all do, that we don't have anything for the next 100 years. But nevertheless, so these are realities where Dr. Sailesh Rao talked about it, Dr. Nandita Asha talked about it, that these are going to happen unless we have a shift in our consciousness as humanity. Uh, so what are your recommendations for single specialty healthcare providers such as LVPI to prepare themselves for the inevitable future pandemics that we will encounter in the years to come? You've already alluded to it, but if I were a single specialty uh, doing a cardiac or a maternity or whatever, cancer, what are the three or four top things that you would tell them that look, the pandemic, if it comes 10, 15 years from now, please start preparing these menu card of stuff so that you can be ready for the next wave of uh, pandemic. I'll address your question uh, based on our own learnings. One is uh, what helped us and what will help in future is making any organization with a single specialty or multi-specialty a value-based organization. Clear values, constant, eternal focus on those values and make sure as many members of the team as possible align with those values. That helped us big time during this pandemic. The second is developing a team care approach, as Mr. Sadanandan also has alluded to earlier, we should not be dependent on just the physicians. We should build a care team that would encompass all cadres, the nurses, the technicians, the managers, the support personnel, everybody. Ideally, every physician should have at least 10 to 15 such people helping the physician. That makes the care more efficient, equitable, and reach all levels. The third thing that we have learned from this is uh, something that we did over the past 25 years that has helped us is the decentralized and distributed care model. 
we did not just build tertiary centers in big cities. We went out into the rural areas and built permanent infrastructure in 20 rural areas for secondary level centers. And surrounding each a cluster of 10 primary centers. So everybody has primary eye care available within a distance of 10 kilometers from the, where they live. Everybody has access to secondary care within 50 kilometers of where they live. If these two levels of care are of good quality, with well-trained human resources and good infrastructure, 80 to 85 percent of all care can be just done there. There is no need for any of these rural population to travel to the big cities for their care and tertiary care is not required for many such. In fact, we started three, four years ago and it got accelerated again during this time is we are beginning to cascade down many elements of tertiary care into secondary levels. The other thing that we, we have to do is adoption of technology. We don't become solely dependent on technology. Our theme is technology combined with the talent will give you the best results. And then when you couple that with the tenderness, that is the care element of the healthcare profession, that caring element, then with, that's when you get the most best results. So these are all the lessons that we have learned. And I think any single specialty organization can uh, replicate what we, what we have as a model. And I sincerely believe that. And we are hoping that many other friends in other specialties will begin to replicate these models and move away from concentration on big cities and begin to develop high quality secondary and primary care centers within their specialties. Uh, that will serve them well in any situation, pandemic or otherwise. And uh, the recovery also will be faster. One thing for sure, post-pandemic, most people will not travel long distances for their care. Unless you are available to them closer to where they live, most of the people will not seek the tertiary care services unless their medical problem is such complex that can be cared for only in the city tertiary care hospital. Uh, this is absolutely wonderful. It's a very crisp menu card for anybody. And I uh, dare say that what you said is also applicable. You yourself prefaced it for multi-speciality hospitals as well. So the first one is a value-driven organization. Second is team care with a 1 to 15 ratio. Third is focus on distributed and decentralized care. And intelligently merge, not technology for tech's sake, like many major hospitals in cities are doing to have one-upmanship over their competitors, but rather technology, talent, and tenderness combined in a very, very creative way. And uh, probably alluding to one of the things that you said earlier, also building up reserves for a rainy day, that has held you in good stead, you know, and rather than splurging every money that we have on needless fancy uh, interiors and this and that, lobbies and so on, systematically build reserves that can last for one or two years. And perhaps uh, just to add some value uh, to whatever has been discussed so far, also the government's push on preventive care and promotive care, that somehow, of course, in some specialties like eye care, it may not be possible, but in cardiac, for example, it's possible, taking cues from what Nandita Shah had said and so on, a good lifestyle, good eating habits and so on. But that is looking like far in the horizon. But with this, I'd like to thank the panelists and close the formal panel discussion. And we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. I'd like to flag the first set of questions to Dr. Rajiv. Uh, already I've told him, uh, how do we prevent this gaming of the system in the insurance uh, domain? and also the lack of motivation of primary care workers. I'm not making a broad brush statement. I'm sure there are very, very motivated primary care workers at all levels, but uh, there are some sordid stories of tremendous uh, motivational issues and gaming the system. So uh, Rajivji, if you can address these, these are very important issues when we start 
devolving the care to the uh, primary level. And I'd invite the audience to also flag a few questions. I can see one comment and one question so far. Over to Dr. Rajiv. Um, one thing, a sobering thing we have to remember is that the German health system, uh, German insurance system was started, I think, in 1880s or something by Bismarck. That is where it starts. They haven't got it right even now. I mean, they, they, they got it reasonably right, but they still have problems. You know. Now, uh, what we need to remember is that consumers and providers are human beings. They will respond to incentives. There are uh, ways in which this can be controlled. There are ways in which it can't be controlled. Some bit of gaming would be there. Now, the uh, if we if we really go on to a contractual based relationship, then we have to build one the regulatory structure that can uh, you know uh, that can hold hospitals uh, accountable uh, for their uh, thing. I mean, and. And, and clinicians uh, listening to me would rise and protest straight away. You know, we've had a uh, very bad experience with the regulation and so on. But Clinical Establishment Act might be a bad instance, but you cannot have a good health system unless it, there, is a, there is a clear regulation and, and rules that everyone plays by. That is rule number one. Secondly, we have to understand I mean, uh, if you're an economist, you would remember the 1963 article by Arrow on uh, starting from there, you know, the gaming uh, of, of or, so the way the providers respond to incentives and how markets fail is something that has been a, uh, that's been a very heavily researched topic in, in health economics and ways have been developed in which we can we can have incentives uh, we can have methods of incentivization that reduces the extent of you know uh, uh, non um, uh, healthy incentives and the way people respond to it the third thing is we need a much larger availability of data and that is not possible in a manual based system in, in a manual system it, no uh, health system that that depends on on uh, on payment based that that is indexed to quality that is indexed to outcomes and that is indexed to uh, to to activities can function unless there's a system for for capturing of this of this data so three things one is having a regulatory environment under which health is practiced whether we like it or not and that can't be just the policing kind of thing. You know, we need to look at regulations that have worked elsewhere. Two, having a system of, uh, you know, of uh, designing a system of payment and incentives based on global understanding of how providers respond to different financial incentives. <clears throat> and three, having a system for collection, analysis, and dissemination of data, which becomes a backbone for managing the, 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 the interaction, uh, uh, the transactions. That is, services being consumed by the uh, patient and uh, payment being made to providers. So unless we invest in this, you, ca you, you cannot have, uh, uh, you, will, you will discourage honest people and promote people who want to game. And my request is, Please don't tar everyone to the same brush. I mean, like, you know, uh, uh, having worked in insurance at different levels, I know that ideally most of us would like to do, do, do the right thing. But can you create an environment in which I can do the right thing? Can you create a, 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 an incentive system in which I'm encouraged to do the right thing? That's a challenge for the regulators we respond to. Secondly, you know, I... And maybe we are talking about different, uh, yeah, we've interacted with different kinds of providers. You know, I make it, a, when I was health secretary, I would make it a point to meet every fresh recruit and talk to them, talk to them, you know, and talk to them totally candidly. And I'm impressed by the level of commitment, the level of idealism that I found on these kids. In six months, we'll ruin them. I promised them to ruin them in six months. You know, the system is so badly uh, adjusted in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of not providing incentives, not, I mean, uh, discouraging initiative and so on. Interestingly, what we found, a major change that we have seen now is when the uh, control of primary health centers were passed on to elected officials, panchayat presidents, 
they do a much better job of sustaining the independence of these boys and girls and i'm impressed by the uh, number of you know excellent institutions these kids have built up and it brings tears to your eyes you know so the the challenges kids and uh, the, the youngsters of today are idealistic and motivated that's my belief it's to us to create a system in which this is encouraged and not demotivated and i'm afraid the uh, systems in every uh, institution i mean especially hospitals private and government are not geared to create the motivation for it let's first create that it it has been done and then blame others for for you no know, not being motivated enough thank you absolutely sir you've hit the nail on the head uh, david osborn i think he is the guy who wrote a very influential book on uh, reinventing the government and he said it's not that people are bad they're good people trapped in bad systems is what creates bad performance so i think uh, the whole issue is how do you create systems and that's where dr rao uh, touched upon a value based organization so perhaps at whatever levels like you've been a exemplary bureaucrat in the uh, indian uh, administrative service so people like you have shown the way that it's possible there are many others hundreds of other great leaders in the bureaucracy and private sector who have created extraordinary organizations so i think how do we make them as role models for others to get inspired because at a young age college going even the school that i am in indian school of business people are very idealistic but two years later some of them say kya karna hai and they start slowly becoming cynical not because of any fault of theirs but they've been trapped in a lousy system so i think uh, this is uh, something where everybody has to wake up and perhaps the transformation starts with each individual leader saying what type of organization do i want to create there are enough role models for people to learn from and that's one of the mandates of ehac to present such role models to the uh, aspiring healthcare providers across the country thank you sir uh, i'd like to now flag one comment and uh, then one question and if there are some one or two more questions we can take mahan trust this is ashish satav uh, mahan trust is providing medical services in tribal area of melgat maharashtra we are conducting blindness control programs for 400 tribal villages can dr rao lv pi guide us for telemedicine using community blindness control program i'm sure this uh, perhaps dr rao can answer this but uh, uh, i'll request uh, arnas to just give her mail id and she can connect your mail to dr rao so that you can take it forward dr rao would you like to quickly respond to this no it will be a pleasure to help but i think the what you said is correct i think if uh, you contact arnas and then uh, if you connect me by email i'll be happy to help you and uh, our group can guide you as to how to develop these services thank you this question is directed to uh, dr baswal what if you have a solution for maternity and diabetes remote care how can one explore the possibilities in indian healthcare system so i think what uh, farid uh, who is the questioner is asking is how can uh, we tweak technologies that are available uh, you know remote like the doctor rao talked about the telemedicine rajiv ji talked about telemedicine and so on so can this be extrapolated to care for maternity and diabetes dr baswal would you like to respond especially on the maternity part so oh, yeah, i can respond on both of them so so basically you know what happens is that uh, once you have some technology i think uh, wherever you are you can approach to the in the state and in the state you have the mission director Uh, or the principal secretary they can approach with their concept not that this is the thing which they have if they have a backing of funding it will be excellent they want to do something because in the government sector you you come up with not of uh, you know these innovations but they have to be proved right for basically you know taking up and uh, scaling up so uh, you, once you have this uh, you know some uh, concept road not ready you can share with the, the mission director of the state and the principal secretary health 
and they will uh, in, in case you have funding it will be excellent but uh, you can approach the various you know for funding you can approach the various donors which are bill and melinda gates you know, usaid unicef and uh, if if they happen to fund your uh, this then you can do a pilot and if you can show that it has an effect i think uh, the state will be ready to accept and uh, scale up, scale it up thank you dr baswal i'd like to say that uh, perhaps the way forward is innovation by youngsters like uh, farid and others everybody who has ideas today there's a good ecosystem uh, really because of a lot of incredible role models that have come up so sky is the limit in terms of innovation imagination and wanting to do something to improve the overall status of humanity whichever domain we touch whether it is ecology livelihood education or uh, healthcare or many other domains transportation and uh, technology enables all this to happen so uh, whatever technology telemedicine in maternity i'm sure one young entrepreneur will come up with some brilliant idea of how this can be done so with that i'd like to essentially bring this uh, to a close uh, we had a very 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 thought provoking uh, discussion and absolutely i want to thank every one of the panelists who have been brilliant in uh, bringing serious thought provoking food uh, which we are going to capture uh, dr rajiv ji has a thing uh, comment the pmj ay empanel hospitals provided care at standard rates maybe i'll request him to elaborate this a little bit for the benefit of all of us uh, and then i'll give my concluding yes, remarks sir. and hand over to arnas for uh, the summary by dr santosh kraleti Uh, Sandosh had Sandosh had raised this question. This actually responds to Sandosh's question. Oh, okay, okay. I have government-sponsored health insurance program. So, so, so the uh, PMJY did uh, cover this, and uh, at least in Kerala, I know that uh, the uh, we call them CASP uh, in Kerala. The hospitals that were uh, covered under that were a major source of uh, you know uh, providing care uh, at PMJY rates. The private hospitals. did provide pmjy uh, uh, rates and and i believe in many other states also it happened so i think pmjy where it functions has come good on on uh, on on covid management thank you thank you so on my personal behalf as uh, the moderator for this panel i want to personally thank rajiv ji dinesh ji and uh, dr rao all incredible life experiences they brought and enriched the whole thing from our side as ehsc we intend to bring out a very nice book on this and the 19th we have the next uh, meeting on 19th for known from 9 to 130 and uh, so we'll bring out a book actually which i hope through the good offices of baswal ji and rajiv ji we can take it to the government also because there's a lot of uh, things of course we'll edit it in a way that is more easy to follow as a you know do's and don'ts and so on with your permission sir can we do that rajiv ji because you have given uh, so many interesting thoughts all the panelists here uh, if you're preparing a book and uh, if if if, uh, if if i'm going to be cited i'd like to see the draft before you go go ahead with it if sure we'd also like to give the ownership of the authorship to you and all the panelists we are just going to be the sutradars to make it happen but the authors will be you people who have given these valuable ideas but i will I, definitely yeah, pass the draft to you sir first yeah, good, yeah. thank you thank you i'm happy to um, to 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 i mean have you used uh, what what i just mentioned yeah but we would like to put on the cover the authorship or contribution from dr sailesh rao and onwards to all the people who are going to be in these two half days thank you sir okay arnas you want to uh, uh, go to the last part of today we are exactly on time Yes, thank you, DDR, and thank you, panelists, for your valuable uh, talk. And I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Santosh Kumar Kraleti to give the uh, vote of thanks and kind of sum up the day for us. And uh, Dr. Santosh uh, is the All India Joint Secretary for Saksham, and he's the Country Director for Camba. So, Dr. Santosh, please take it over. Dr. Santosh, you're on mute, brother. He's on. Yeah, got it. Yeah. 
So, uh, very good afternoon to everyone, and uh, thank you, Professor DVR and Arnaz, for giving me this opportunity. If I may interrupt, Santosh, for uh, just a second, you are on oh, yeah? the most common word used in the last one year. If you take a histogram of all the sentences spoken <laughs> by humanity, you are on mute is the most common word. Perfect. <laughs> so which is sometimes good for the society as well. Uh, and it has been uh, uh, quite some time that uh, I have met uh, uh, Sri Rajiv Sadarandanji. Uh, and it's been pleasant uh, that we met him here in this uh, uh, great enriching experience. Uh, we are, I have been meeting Dr. G. N. Rao quite uh, often. And uh, again, today it has been quite an enriching experience. And we had uh, Dr. Dinesh Baswal from the ministry. Thank you very much, Dr. Dinesh, as well, uh, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, before I, uh, I quickly summarize the, today's morning's talks, I would also like to thank uh, the ISB uh, Maths Center for Healthcare and also for the Center for Marketing, who have been uh, rock solid behind uh, the e EHAC. And uh, as we all know, it was quite an enriching and scintillating experience for the last uh, three, four hours that we have been in this forum. Uh, if I remember Dr. Silesh Rao's uh, thoughts, I think uh, Hyderabad will soon have to quit the biryani and uh, we all need to become vegan. And uh, I don't know how much of uh, economists would uh, talk about the loss losses because of the, uh, you know, loss of Hyderabad biryani. And I don't know, the weekend will go without a feast and a toast. Uh, but then uh, uh, it was uh, quite some uh, thought-provoking stuff that he, uh, he had pointed out that climate change is actually a public health crisis. It's not just a mere environmental issue. And he talked so much about ecological civilization building and the indigenous ideas that need to be brought in to actually bring a sea change in the nature and how we interact with Mother Earth. Uh, very, 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 very candid and uh, thoughts that he had shared during the discussions as well. And very important uh, case studies that he has brought in about uh, Paul Chatlin and about uh, how we have so many codes, which are even Raju Sadarandan said would like, so many codes for making money, but not so many codes for actual treatment. So it was uh, quite a, a, a learning experience for me as well uh, on personal front. Then we had uh, from Sharon, Dr. Nandita Shah, uh, her rich experience about, uh, you know, vegan uh, diets and also diets which are rich in nutrition, uh, which can actually uh, cure diseases. She's talked so much about reversing cardiological diseases and cardiovascular diseases. And I'm sure uh, she would have provoked a lot of thoughts about urban farming, organic farming, and uh, kitchen gardens. And I'm sure many of us would go back and do some of it in the weekend. The uh, discussion that uh, Mr. Subodh uh, Kumar had uh, with the three panelists, again, Dr. Sailesh Rao, Dr. Komal Prasad, and Mr. Madhu Chandan, all of them very, very grounded and brought in the, uh, uh, you know, problems faced by the communities and the patients during COVID and how we could actually, uh, could tide over a similar crisis in the future. In the second half of the session, again, it was an enriching experience for all of us, especially to start with Mr. Rajiv Sadan and then about how he spoke about the positive impacts, about the sacrifices made by the doctors, how they actually pulled up the socks. Many of them started intubation in government hospitals and how government hospitals have functioned efficiently during COVID. And some of the negative impacts of how many COVID warriors we have lost of course, uh, there was a 
scarcity in human resources. There are some serious gaps, training gaps, and many, many learnings from uh, COVID about the human resources, about how not to fudge data, and how we are seeing even today that probably half of the cases in some of the states have not been reported. The testings have not been reported. All of this he has brought out very, very candidly, and has been very open about how we can actually resurrect the system. So, uh, and trust is something which is very, very important, and how we cannot be blatantly opaque, and how important is data, has been again, uh, time and again, pointed out by Rajiv sir. And uh, it was interesting to again listen to Dr. G. N. Rao sir. We have had quite some conversations during COVID uh, to learn some of the experiences from LVPI on how to make an organization sustainable. For Saksham, uh, especially LVPI uh, is a model uh, where we are trying to learn how to prepare for a rainy day and uh, how to use technology talent with tenderness and how to prepare, uh, how to decentralize the uh, health system, how not just not to concentrate all your health system at a tertiary care. This has been echoed by uh, uh, Rajiv Sadanandan sir as well on how to build a strong primary care model, probably during his lifetime. Let's hope so uh, that we build something like an NHS in, in India. So, uh, and then very, very important thoughts from Dr. Dinesh Baswal uh, about the trade-offs because of the scant human resources in terms of maternal and child health. Uh, we, are, we are working at Nilo for Hospital. We are seeing that there has been a gross reduction in the number of deliveries that have been happening at tertiary care, secondary care uh, hospitals. So this is something that probably are taking place at homes. So as rightly pointed out, home deliveries could have uh, spiked a lot. Mortality could have spiked a lot. We have also seen cases where private hospitals have charged 5 lakh to 6 lakh rupees for a COVID delivery. So uh, some of the important uh, things that uh, Dr. Dinesh has brought out uh, very, very vividly in his talk. And I hope uh, we, uh, we, we will see a sort of a, a vertical where we will have a stream of maternal and child health human resources at primary to secondary to tertiary level, uh, which could be a post COVID uh, policy from uh, the maternal and child care division. So very, very thought provoking, very important uh, uh, things that have almost, I've noted down in more than 20 pages that I've scribbled all through this uh, for us. And we thank from the bottom of our hearts from the Equitable Healthcare Access Consortium uh, all of you who have uh, taken time out and who have uh, shared your thoughts, your experiences, and your uh, uh, experiences of all your life. So uh, that is it from my end. Thank you so much. And uh, the second uh, session of this uh, post-COVID learning session would be on 19th December. That would be uh, organized again by the EHAC and Arnaz would be coordinating on that front. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Dr. Santos. Thank you, everybody. And see you on the 19th.